Greetings, Family Community Church. This is our uh, Tuesday night, which will be Wednesday night, uh, Bible study. <clears throat> this will be number three in the series, Overcoming the World, or the fancy title that I gave to it in the original, it's just too long to print, is A Field Guide for Living as a Christian While in Exile in Babylon. That's a lot of words. But uh, <clears throat> the, the concept, the thinking is, we're in the world, just not of the world, and how do we behave? How do we conduct ourselves? What do we do? How do we keep ourselves from some of the attitudes and the mores of the fallen world? <clears throat> but um, let's uh, get started with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you in Jesus' name that you have taken us out of this world, but you've kept us in. And so, Lord, we ask for understanding on this. What are we to do? Why are we here? What should be our attitudes? How, can, how do we protect ourselves from not uh, living like citizens of the world? Father, how, how do we conduct ourselves as citizens of heaven? What do we do? Lord, these are legitimate questions. We know your word has the answer. And so we're asking you to open our understanding to, in, 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 to increasingly make it clear to us so we don't stumble and fall and grind around and make mistakes. But Lord, we want to live uprightly for you. We want to bring you glory. We want to bring you honor. And we want your testimony to spread to the ends of the earth. So train us, we pray. Teach us, we pray, through the word. And we give thanks for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles, the scripture that I'm most basing most of my thoughts in are he is here, Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1, 2, and 3. <clears throat> so if we could read those things, we'll remind ourselves uh, of what we're trying to achieve. Paul writes, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. See, we've been taken out of the world. You walked in those once, the course of this world. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. We were children of wrath like the rest of mankind. This is the death sentence that the fallen world is under as a result of its rebellion against God, the Creator and Redeemer. And before we were taken out of the world, we too, our destiny, was to have only one experience, and that is to experience God's wrath for our rebellion. Now, before we get a superior attitude towards the world, which sometimes hinders our evangelism. We must not click our tongues about the fallen world and those filthy people. Uh, we have to have a good attitude uh, towards the fallen world because we were part of them. We once walked according to the course of this world. And as we talked about worldview last week, and we'll keep picking up that subject next week, but what we talked about was the course of this world is the world's worldview. How they view things. How they conduct themselves in light of how they view things. How they view God. And so we are not to adapt a, a superior attitude because the Lord has redeemed us. Instead, we must have compassionate and empathetic and, and almost pity those who still follow the course of this world, who are under the tyranny of the trifecta that we talked about, that is the enemy of God, sin, the flesh, and the world. Those three things form a trifecta which are constantly oppressing uh, all humans. Now, we have answers with what we're, why we're covering this, the, these teachings called overcoming the world, and we're looking into those answers, but the poor fallen world um, they can't stop what's happening to them. They are under this constant tyranny and pressure and forced 
like a, like a master of a, and a slave situation to have to follow the course of this world. We are not. And so that's what we're learning. We're learning how to conduct ourselves as those who are not subject because of the Lord's victory to the flesh, the world, and the devil. Now, I want to cover in this particular teaching, the question I'm asking is, what is wrong with the fallen world? Don't you sometimes listen to uh, the attitudes of the world or the philosophies of the world and you think to yourself, what is wrong with everybody? Why do they think this way? And I want to look at some of the answers to that question because I have a growing concern constantly that we, the, the church of Jesus Christ is highly influenced by the attitudes of the world and especially their views of God. And so I want to take time in this particular lesson to turn the microscope down and look at their attitude and look at their reaction to God to make sure that as the people of God that we keep ourselves unstained, untouched by this particular attitude and reaction to God. And so I want, to, I want us to understand that the people of the fallen world, that such were some of us, we came from this, were those who were destined and subject to experience God's wrath before we were justified in Christ. Now that we've been justified in Christ, uh, our destiny is no longer to experience God's wrath. But the rest of mankind continues to be under that sentence, that death sentence. So we talk as Christians about being saved from this fallen world. But saved from what? You see, that's the troubling question that we don't, we f we don't find in the modern presentation of the gospel. Saved from what? I would think that very few Christians could answer with Ephesians 2 uh, int intellectually and say, I'm saved from the wrath of God. God was going to pour all his wrath out on me for my rebellion in judgment. And, and Jesus saved me from that wrath. I'm not certain anymore because the modern version of the gospel is, is so weak and diluted uh, that it doesn't include these concepts of a wrathful God, of sinful human beings, of human beings in, in obtuse rebellion against their creator. That doesn't seem to be a factor in the modern presentation of the gospel. Uh, <clears throat> so in order to fully appreciate salvation, uh, it's important to understand that we were destined to experience this wrath until we were justified in Christ by God's grace and by God's mercy. Thanks be to God. But I, I can prove this if I had more time, and I'll just mention one thing. I see little snippets on TV where a young person might say, they're maybe in their early 20s, and say, you know, I used to believe in God, and I used to go to church, but really it's not relevant to my life anymore. And I, just, I think to myself, do you understand, if you are saved, what you were saved from? How can you make such a, a whitewashed statement? How can you so casually just click your tongue and how, how can you do that? You must not know what you've been saved from. That's my own conclusion. And that's why my growing concern is uh, if the true gospel were to be preached, we would understand that we were saved from the wrath of God for sin through Jesus Christ. So in this lesson, we want to see what the actual condition of the fallen world is, because I think it's been too whitewashed. It's been too sanitized. So we become so friendly with the world and so compatible with the world, that is the church, that, uh, you know, you might view me and even this teaching as, what's your problem? But um, I've taken a vow that I won't be silent for Zion's sake. And so uh, it's necessary to speak up, that we all understand what is the real condition of the fallen world. 
because that's the world we were delivered from. Now, in the context of our teachings of overcoming the world, we want to be alert. We're not looking to pick a fight. We're not looking to look down on the world. We're not looking to grind them into powder with our dogmatics. But we want to be alert to not having the attitude about God that the fallen world has. Because if we're not careful, because we're in this world, we mix with fallen people every day. Some of them should even be our friends. But if we're not on, on alert, if we're not on guard, their attitudes will influence us. And we will find ourselves in the same dilemma towards God that they are in, even though we're saved. To understand what exactly the condition of the fallen world is, we need to turn to the great, greatest treatment in the Bible as to the fallen nature of the world. And I apologize to those who follow my teachings. I refer to this chapter so much now. I believe it's because it's so heightened into me, this, this necessity of understanding what the true nature of the gospel is and the true nature of Christ's penal substitution to take the wrath of God for us and how important that is to the preaching of the gospel and the preservation of truth, not to mention the conduct of the Christian community. Uh, but Paul, it doesn't, there's nowhere else to go. You can read psychology books, you can do all kinds of stuff, but Paul does such a masterful treatment in Romans to the true fallen condition that uh, we have to use it. So I'm reading from Romans chapter 1, verse 18, and I'm going to read all the way through, and including up to 11 in chapter 2, because it contains basically one thought. It's difficult to break off Paul's thought because he's such a prolific preacher. Um, it's dangerous to just snap his, teach, his th thinking off and go into another subject or divide up his teaching into all kinds of categories, which we find in our modern Bibles with a little heading every five verses just for us Western readers to get, oh, what's he talking about? Well, let's just read this together. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth for what can be known about god is plain to them because god has shown it to them for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power and divine nature are you ready have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world Verse 7, in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, 
inventors of evil, disobedience to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give e approval to those who practice them. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. He's talking about the fallen world. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Apparently they do. Verse 4, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Verse 6, he will render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. I mean, Selah, pause, and reflect on Paul's genius statements here about the condition of the fallen world. Now, what have we learned from this section of Scripture? There is sufficient evidence in God's creation to convince rational beings that there is a God. There's sufficient evidence. You hear unbelievers say, I need more proof. And the Bible says, no. There is sufficient evidence in God's creation to convince rational beings that there is a God. Fallen humans, however, know, K-N-O-W, Romans 1.18, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. What else have we learned? But they suppress the truth. It is redundant, sorry, repugnant to the rebellious humans. Now, I want you to think about that thought because I'm going to bring it up some more. It is repugnant to rebellious humans that God knows that they know. They not only suppress the truth of God, but they desire strongly that he did not exist. Now, just turning the microscope down a little bit further, I want to look into the original language a little bit here in this passage to clear up our understanding. Again, we're focusing on the condition of the fallen world, what they actually think about God with a view toward not being affected or stained by their attitude. The Greek word for rat there is the word orge, O-R-G-E. It's not a blind fury. It's not a capricious, irrational passion, wrath. It's an anger, all right, but think about a pure holy anger, not the anger of a frustrated parent or the anger of a fired employee or something of that nature on a human scale, but a pure anger that is directed against evil humans, evil humans that reject the truth. There is a, found, a basis for this anger. It's not capricious. It's just, I'm just mad. That God isn't just mad, but he has a, a streamlined lightning strike like anger that is focused in a particular way against a particular sin. God's wrath is directed against man's ungodliness and unrighteousness. 
Now, the Greek word there for ungodliness, a sabia, is how you pronounce it, means a state of opposition to the rule of God. It reflects, of course, the anger and the, it, the, 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 the state of opposition in Psalm 2. We will not have this man rule over us. So it's not a, oh, I didn't know, uh, nobody ever told me. No, it's a complete knowing that God is providential and he rules over all things, but it is a stance, a position of strong rebellion with fist shaking in rage to say, no, I don't care who he is, I don't care what he says, I'm going to live the way I want to live and I'm going to behave the way I want to behave. And nobody's going to tell me what to do. That's the position of the fallen world. And the word unrighteousness is the Greek word idikeia, and it means an assault against the righteousness of God. Again, a fist-shaking kind of action. I don't care who you are. I don't have to live up to your standard. And I refuse to live up to your standard, and I'm going to live any old way I please. Doesn't that sound like the language of rebellion? We hear it in a very muted form with our little children that we try to raise, or our grandchildren. A defiance sometimes of the parental order. Let that be just like a little, you know, those snow globes. He says, here's the city of San Diego, and you shake it, and that it's supposed to look like San Diego. You don't really have the city of San Diego. There's just a little model. But in these little human beings, we have a little model of the rage against uh, boundaries, the rage against parameters, the rage against there's somebody over me who's not going to permit me to do things and is going to steer me and guide me the way I should do things. And there's, there's a natural rebellion. Where does that come from? You don't have to preach much on original sin when you've got a two or a three or a four-year-old. Where did it come from? It's not a learned behavior. It comes from the nature of sin, a fist shaking against God, indeed against all authorities. As young people grow up and they're ungoverned, uh, it's translated at that teacher, it's translated at that coach. If they go in the army, it's against that sergeant. If they go into business, it's against that boss. This fist raging. Until you're taken out of this world and learned a new form of living that is as a son of obedience and an acceptance of divine authority over your life and in all the course of your life from others. But unrighteousness means it's assault against the righteousness of God. Uh, the composition here, just for a little help here, is a there's a literary device that Paul is using here in the Greek. It's called <clears throat> henedias is the word for it. It's a common literary term that's used in English grammar. And it's a literary device where two words um, are used in one complex idea is expressed by two words. In this respect, unrighteousness and ungodliness is one complex idea of how fallen men react against God. And so God's wrath, therefore, is directed against something specific. The wickedness that comes from suppressing the truth or repressing the truth to help us understand that concept. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but like repressing a, a bad memory because it's undesirable. I just don't want to think about it. But it's worse than that. It's a pressing down into the subconscious and not allowing it to flower into the conscious existence. Romans 1.19, that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident like they haven't been shown. We're not, even, we're not even talking about Jesus yet. We're talking about God and knowledge of God. The fallen world has it. You had it. But you fought against it. You repressed it. You pushed it down. And you lived in a state, yes, of utter rebellion. The very best of us, 
You may have gone to Sunday school, but until this condition is dealt with, it sees and broods and it only it shows itself when you're pulled over by a policeman. Oh, who does he think he is? Or a boss tells you to work on the weekend. It shows up, doesn't it? It springs up and we don't like it. But that's the condition of the fallen nature. The fallen world holds down the truth within them which ought not to be held down. This what God has revealed should not be repressed. It should be paid attention to in the very, the very least that God can expect from somebody who doesn't press it down is an acknowledgement of him and a thanking of him. And yet we, we, we refuse to do even that. Going on in Romans 1.20, for his invisible attributes, naming his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. Well, I just didn't know. I need more information. I need proof that God exists. No, you don't. You're only kicking the can down the road. You're only not wanting to give in to what you know is actually true. You know. But you refuse to acknowledge it. And that's the condition of the fallen world. They are revealed to us in the things that have been made so that all human beings are without excuse. All human beings are under the sentence of divine wrath because of this action of suppression, which is a natural uh, tendency, proclivity that we have as fallen creatures to press it down and not to acknowledge it because of its unpleasantness to our rebellion. Revel, uh, summary, Romans 1.21. For even though they knew God, they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but the, they became futile in their thinking and had their foolish hearts were darkened. You know, some commentators might say in the, for the Bible, oh, poor humans, they're blinded to the truth. No, they're not. They see, they perceive, they just choose not. And so the enemy uses that sinful nature, that, that act of disobedience, that, that act of, of, uh, of, 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 of rage against God's providence, against God himself, against God's nature, and they exacerbate it by uh, working in the sons of disobedience. Clearly, yeah, yeah, keep that attitude up. And those people who keep that attitude up are destined to experience God's wrath, as we were. Children of wrath, like the rest of mankind, such were some of us. Paul reaffirms that men knew God. The problem is not a failure to honor what was not known, but a refusal to honor what was clearly known. Oh, if I had only known, I would have honored God. No, you knew, and you made a decision, a choice of your own free will to refuse to acknowledge God and to love him and to thank him. So knowledgeable men, not ignorant men, are the focus of the divine wrath and judgment. What follows in Romans 1 is a sordid display of crimes that arise out of the rejection of God. I mean, I don't want to read it again. It makes me want to take a shower. It's filthy. It's filthy. But this is the course of the world. This is how the world behaves. This is what the world do, does in its state of rejection. <clears throat> they submit to crimes against God and against humanity. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wrote down here, the behavior of the fallen reveals a deep hostility and a burning rage against God in the human heart. It is fallen man's reaction against God that we must be on guard against as Christians. Because if we're not careful in our constant interaction with the world, we could easily pick up that our reaction can be the same as theirs. 
even though we say we love God, the triune being. But I want to look now, um, believe it or not, my undergraduate degree is in business psychology. Uh, but I had to learn a lot of psychology, and like the rest of students, I thought to myself, well, I'll never use this. This is hopeless. This is stupid. But here I am finding myself using it. I graduated in 1978 with a degree, a bachelor's degree, in business psychology. <laughs> and for the first time, well, maybe not, maybe subconsciously I did employ it, but I, I remembered some of the old notes and teachings that I used to have concerning this psychology and I'm going to apply it now to uh, understand in three steps uh, how human beings react to a negative situation. What happens to them? And in this case, the negative reaction is against God himself. It's in three stages. And granted, this is straight out of psychology. However, I think you'll find it applicable and uh, maybe helpful. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. But the first stage of reaction against any kind of threat or any kind of uh, something you don't like, in this case it's God, they hate God, is trauma. Yeah, trauma. Uh, you've heard of soldiers who experience war, the trauma that they experience. Uh, a lot of soldiers come back from the battlefields needing legitimate help because of the, of the things they've been exposed to that are negative. Well, trauma in this respect is, uh, the definition is mental and emotional shock when exposed to threat. You can be traumatized by a situation. Perhaps you were in a serious car wreck. Perhaps you were in a, in, in a, in a very emotional, dirty, stinking divorce, and it caused a trauma in you, a reaction to a threat. <clears throat> so I'm applying this to man's reaction to God and say this, confrontation with God shocks fallen men. They don't want to hear it. God is a threat to the fallen nature. What's at stake here? Why are they threatened? What's their problem? Well, man has created his own moral standard. Uh, you're okay, I'm okay. Hey, as long as I'm not hurting anybody. But compared to God's moral standard, he's a threat. He's a threat to man's quest for autonomy. I'll not have anybody rule over me. I'm my own person. I live with my own dreams. I have my own things that I want to achieve. I might tag God on as a little, you know, sort of a, uh, you know, I don't know, a little covering or something, but I'm not going to submit and do everything that God tells me to do. And it also threatens man's desire for concealment. What happened when Adam first had an encounter with God? Was he refreshed? Was he given to fits of laughter because he was in God's presence? Did he fall on the ground and tremble and shake and just enjoy the presence of the Lord? No. After he fell, after he sinned against God, his first desire was for concealment. He hid behind a tree. I mean, it's stupid. God created the tree. God knew where Adam was. He was just trying to get Adam to admit his state, which he never did. But ever since, man has, a, has had a desire to concealment, for concealment. Secret sin. Not letting anybody know, putting on a front. How many crime shows have we seen where uh, a, a guy who looked like a dutiful husband is really living a double life? He uh, gets girls and things on the side and maybe even killed some people. I don't know, but we see it all the time. But man has a desire to be concealed, and when he's found out, it is traumatic to his system. But they can't stand the light, they love the darkness. And they want to stay in the darkness because it, 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 it appeals to their sense of concealment. I'll give you an illustration. When we were young, uh, our family didn't have much money and we had no time in the summer because my father worked sundown to sun up to sundown. And so for four or five months of the year, uh, being in a blue collar family, 
It just meant work. And so we didn't have, we never went on vacations. I didn't, I never knew what a vacation was <laughs> until I got married. <clears throat> and I still didn't take them because I didn't know what to do. But uh, what we would do on weekends especially is we would take a trip from St. Louis, Missouri to just uh, 30 or 40 miles away uh, <clears throat> to the west to Merrimack Caverns. Uh, it's ca- it's, Missouri is a cave state. We have a lot of caves in the state. And uh, this was open to the public and it was supposed to be Jesse James Hideout, which uh, I find spurious, but at the same time, it was a, an attraction for all Missourians to go to. And the caves, it was 98 degrees in St. Louis, and driving in non-air-conditioned cars, hot, hot, hot. The caves were 60 degrees, so it was kind of a relief, too, to go into the caves. But you go into the caves, and they were dimly lit, and you go down these little trails, and you're in the bowels of the earth, and it's just fat. You see the stalactites or whatever they're called hanging from the ceilings. It's kind of cool. But then you've got to come out of the cave. And when you come out of the cave, especially in the summertime, how many of us were, were just the bright summer sun? Ah, you're in this dark cave for any period of time. You want to shield your eyes. That's what it's like being confronted with God, who is pure truth and pure light. And no fallen human being wants that exposure. They want to stay in their secrets. They want to stay in their sin. They don't want to be exposed by the light. Listen to Psalm 68 verses 1 and 2. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered. All those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so shall God drive them away. As wax melts before fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. You see, do we really know this being who is defined to us in the Bible as God? Or have we suffered a trauma in knowing who he is and have made other arrangements? We'll get to that in a minute. I'd like you to listen to uh, a quote from John Calvin out of Calvin's Institutes. This is from book one. Uh, (coughs) Excuse me, commenting on these concepts of what it means to be exposed to God. He writes this, If at midday we either look down to the ground or on surrounding objects which lie open to our view, We think ourselves endued with a very strong and piercing eyesight. But when we look up to the sun and gaze at it unveiled, the sight which did excellently well for the earth is instantly so dazzled and confounded by the refulgence as to oblige us to confess that our acuteness in discerning terrestrial objects is mere dimness when applied to the sun. Thus, too, it happens in estimating our spiritual qualities. So long as we don't look beyond the earth, we're quite pleased with our righteousness, our wisdom, and virtue. We address ourselves in the most flattering terms and seem only less than demigods. But should we once again begin to raise our thoughts to God and reflect what kind of being he is, and how absolute the perfection of that righteousness and wisdom and virtue, to which, as a standard, we are bound to be conformed. What formerly delighted us by its false show of righteousness will become polluted with the greatest iniquity. What strangely imposed upon us under the name of wisdom will disgust by its extreme folly. And what presented the appearance of virtuous energy will be condemned as the most miserable impotence. So far as those qualities in us which seem most perfect from corresponding to the divine purity. So an encounter with the light of God's revelation is a traumatic experience for man. I had an experience with this one time when we were doing some outdoor preaching. Again, in St. Louis, Missouri, we used to have a festival here on the 4th of July at the riverfront by the St. Louis Arch. And uh, I love outdoor preaching. It's fun. We had a megaphone, and back in those days, you were allowed to use one. And you you had these gigantic, I forgot the name of them, walls that are by the river to keep it from flooding and encroaching on the land. And you'd point your megaphone at it, and if you preached 
pointing at those walls in the microphone, it would reverb for, uh, it seemed like miles. And there was millions of people, well, thousands, thousands of people gathered there under the arch at the riverfront between the edge of the Mississippi River and the beginning of the arch grounds there. And there, there was a great festival that was there. And we would hand out tracts, and we would preach, and we would pray for people, and we would do street drama. And I always enjoyed it every year, going down there with a number of Christians and experiencing that July 4th uh, celebration. Well, one time I was preaching, and I had the megaphone, and I was preaching the gospel, and I was talking about the love of Jesus and how he redeems us from our sin and all that. And I'll never forget, um, there was a nice lady, middle-aged lady, maybe a little older, because she had two small children, but I think they were too young to be her. Perhaps she was a grandmother. I don't know. But she was dressed really nice. She didn't have shorts on. She had like a summer dress, and she really looked nice put together, maybe from a, a, a better neighborhood in St. Louis County, perhaps. And she had these little children. They were by some stand, and they were purchasing something. And for whatever reason, she was about maybe, I don't know, 50 yards away from me, perhaps, at a booth. And she heard my preaching, and she whipped around, and she looked at me. And I, it just caught my attention because of the abrupt way that she spun around. I wasn't prepared for it. And then two small children with her there perching a snow cone or whatever they were doing, she left them. And she came directly marching towards me in a a stopping manner, like aggressive, so much so that I lowered the megaphone. I didn't know what was happening. <laughs> I was actually scared. And she was coming towards me, and her face was contorting. I don't want to get too graphic here or expand the story to make it, you know, sound more than it really was. But something was happening to her. She was contorting. Her face got fire red. Her visage was completely changed towards me. She was biting her. I mean, like she was coming for a fight. And so she got closer to me. I'm backing up. I mean, I was in pretty good shape back then, but I didn't want to tangle with a grandmother. I didn't know what was happening. And she got this close to my face, and she started spitting and cursing and terrible words. I have to tell you, I had no response because I was so stunned. And right then and there, two policemen took her under the arms. Maybe they were angels. I don't know. And whisked her away. But I'll never forget. And as I was meditating, thinking about the situation, I, again, I don't want to make too much of it, but her response to the gospel being preached was not casual. It was demonic. It was ugly. It was threatening. It was, it was as if I turned her world upside down. And I wasn't even aiming at her. But I just want to just say that for, for fallen humans to be confronted with God's light is a traumatic experience. But that leads to the second stage of trauma, which is repression, or as the Bible says, suppression. Repression. Repression means to exclude a threatening thought from consciousness, consciousness and push it down by force into the subconscious. So the thought of the threat never fully goes away. But when the light shines on it, it's forced up to the surface and causes that rage, that vehemence, that outrage, that um, t the, the trauma that they experience of the threat of God to their lives. Because the knowledge of God is unacceptable to the fallen rebellious person. So the rebellious person presses it down, presses down its threatening character, just like we do with a bad thought. Maybe a soldier uh, has experienced a lot of things, but he might press it down so he doesn't have to think about it. And then some situation arises and it springs up on him and he's caught unawares, just like this lady with the megaphone was caught unawares. It's still there, but it's pressed down. See, the knowledge of God remains intact, but it's deeply submerged. 
And in this state of deeply submerged, in order to deal with it, is the next and final step of someone who's in trauma is substitution. So you go from trauma to repression to substitution. And if you listen to Romans 1.22, claiming to be wise, they became fools, verse 23, and exchanged, substituted, the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and essential oils. No, I didn't mean to say that. It just slipped. Sorry. Uh, but they substitute the thoughts of God and for creeping things. This act of substituting the God of the Bible for a God that we desire or want is the most insidious of sin, blasphemy, and insult to God. It's John Calvin who said the fallen mind is an idle factory, meaning they know that they should be acknowledging something. Uh, the AA people call it a higher power, but they won't go as too far to say the God of the Bible. It's a substitution. It's less threatening. It's... Uh, we can create him to be controlled and to be nice and, and to be not this vengeful, wrathful God and to have such an incredible bad response to sin. You know, take it easy. Uh, don't be so wrathful. Uh, so we end up defining God in our fallen state. The original knowledge of God uh, with the numerous references to his expressions of wrath and, and judgment his absolute claim over human life is too threatening. So fallen man will redefine God so that he's no threat at all. The substitute for their knowledge of God with a god or goddess. Notice that goddesses are female. They're, they're more gentle sometimes. They're more understanding. They're more helpful. With a god they can handle a God they can take or leave, that they can carry on with their sin and continue to love the darkness. This is the act of substitution. And in the act of substitution by fallen man, this lies my greatest concern for the body of Christ. This is where my concern lies is that we're in the world, we have to mix it up with the world, and knowing that they are traumatized by the knowledge of God, knowing that they repress the knowledge of God, and knowing that they substitute God. The elect have been taken out of the world to know and serve the living triune God of the Bible. But my question is this for all of us. Here's my concern when we talk about overcoming the world. Is it possible that we are still guilty of the crime of substitution? Perhaps we're over the trauma. Perhaps we have, we no longer suppress the knowledge of God. But the final entry into fallen man's condition of substitution, that is the one that has me concerned. It's not called, in the modern church today, it's not called sin anymore. It's called mistakes. During this COVID virus, there's a number of ads on TV to follow Jesus and to go to a certain church that are being advertised on TV. And they had a sinner's prayer on there that I was attracted to. I thought, oh, isn't this lovely that someone's broadcasting the sinner's prayer and maybe people will say it gives me. But there was nothing there mentioned about sin. Nothing about what an insult it is to God that you've created idols. In the sinner's prayer, it said, Forgive me, God, that I've made mistakes. In our fallen condition, we didn't make mistakes. We knew God and purposely sinned against him. That's the crime. We're all without excuse, and we're all guilty. That's Romans 1 through 4. It's inescapable if you're going to preach the real Bible. But again, in the modern church, there's a nervousness to talk about sin and a wrathful God and a, a blood propitiation. And 
oh, we don't want to talk about those things. It's too ghastly. It's too, I heard one preacher even say, believe it or not, a Christian preacher, uh, God certainly wouldn't be a child abuser, would he? I mean, where are we going? It's, it's a concern I have. We're substituting. Um, the kindness of God is promoted universally. But you never hear anything about the severity of God. God makes, in, mo in, in modern churches today, God makes no demands on us. He just offers to help us. That's not the God of the Bible who lays claim to all human existence. It's not like he's an elf on a shelf that you pull down once a year and make wishes to. The God of the Bible is serious about his administration, about who he is, and how he wants to be treated. In the modern church, the promoting of encounters with God by soaking and listening to lullaby music uh, to, to, to fill you and to soothe you and to heal you, but never to confront you. Never in the promotion of experiences with God. Of course the band has to be playing, and of course they're playing music that is just one step beyond yoga, in my opinion. And, you know, people get into these states of somewhat of euphoria, and they create a, an experience with God that is a substitute. Can God soothe and comfort? Of course he does. But most biblical, biblical accounts of humans having encounters with God are not humanly pleasant. I could do 10 lessons on this, but I'll just give you a short example as we're getting closer to our close. Here's Habakkuk in chapter 3, verse 16. Now Habakkuk shook his fist at God. He said, where were you? And he was accusing God of, similar to Job. And when God confronts him, here's Habakkuk's response in Habakkuk 3, 16. I heard and my inward parts trembled. Decay enters my bones, and in, in, in my place I tremble. Where's the encounter with God where our whole condition is shaken? Because God has revealed his holiness and his purity. That's the essence of revival, by the way. In revival, it's never a refreshing. It's never a comfort. It's a reversal of a state of sin into a, a desire to follow God. That's marked with holiness and repentance. Listen to Isaiah 6 when he is confronted by the Lord. He sees the Lord high and lifted up and his train fills the temple. He says, woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live amongst people with unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Most encounters in the Bible or of a not-so-pleasant human experience. It's more of a challenge. It's more of a recognizing my state compared to who he is. Creator versus creature. Pure and holy without sin versus having come from sin. And those experiences of meeting with God through the Word, through prayer, through divine experiences, whatever it might be, uh, are more frequently of a shattering nature and a, and a feeling of being undone nature as opposed to coming out just sort of milky and smooth and silky and weepy and wow, I get a little nervous. Now let me, I gave you two examples here of encounters. I could give you 15 or 20 like it. But I want you to notice something. The two references I made were prophets of the Lord. They weren't fallen men. They were covenant men. They weren't just mere followers of God. They were prophets who spoke on God's behalf. And these are their experiences. So where does that leave us? When you encounter the God of the Bible and you're reading along, uh, immediate, in the, in the closing of your Bible, the, the plea for help sort of just dissolves away and there's more of a plea for mercy and Please help me, God. 
uh, strengthen me so that I don't give in to the fallenness and the, and the rebellious that, is, that fills this world, but that I become increasingly obedient, son, like Jesus. Now, in closing here, I want to say I'm not running a campaign. I'm not writing letters. I'm not writing books against any of these movements. I don't have any heart to do anything like that. I am not trying to adjust anyone. But I, I am saying I have a legitimate concern after 40 years of ministry to see these things going on and to say, have we substituted the God of the Bible for some kind of soft God who's okay with everything and, and approves of evil acts? And we're having conferences now to find out how far can we sin? How, how much can we sin and still be acceptable by God? And I'm saying, what's, what's going on? Why are we drifting the way we are? And I think my main concern, once again, in the, in the context of this series, is that we not be like the world and not allow ourselves to substitute the God of the Bible for a lesser God who is less threatening to our human rebellion. Thank you for listening. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you. I miss seeing people being in this COVID experience. But let me pray and bless us and tune in next week for the fourth installment on overcoming the world. And in the meantime, uh, know the Lord's peace and grace. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for all those who are listening. And I pray, Lord, that you would reveal yourself. I pray that they would dig into their Bibles and they would learn the true nature of the true God that their hearts would respond accordingly, not with fear, not with dread of condemnation, but knowing that you have forgiven us out of this world, that you have restored us to a place uh, where we can, your anger was for a moment, but your favor's for a lifetime. But Father, we, we don't want to lose sight of the fact of who you are. We don't want to create idols of our own and be guilty like the rest of the world of worshiping a God of our making, but bring us back to your standards. Bring us back to who you are. Bring us back to the awe and the wonder and the majesty and the, the dreadfulness of your presence and the, and the head bowing that comes when you, when, you, when you are confronted by the living God. Bring us back to that place. Replace all the gitchy goo and barefoot t-shirts and all the rest of the stuff that goes on in the modern church with a sense of majesty and dignity and who you are. Reveal it to the whole world, we pray. Bring us all to our senses so we won't go on in our rebellion against you. And we ask for forgiveness for any substitutes we've made. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Tune in next week.